this is um, just a high level view of the area basically between LeGrand and Pendleton. And today Robin's going to be talking about uh, his work in the Immigrant Springs area, um, kind of between, let me admit somebody, uh, between roughly Meacham and, and over towards the Immigrant Springs area. Um, so let me um, turn on the share screen so Robin can. Uh, and I think you're good to go, Robin. Okay. All right, can everybody see my map? Yes, good. <clears throat> well, my presentation today has three parts. Uh, the first part is gonna be some map overlays that I've done uh, for, this, uh, for this area of the trail. And the second part, I'm uh, gonna review some, uh, some surveyor note locations. I've been going through surveyor notes for a couple of the townships in, in this area and have got those marked on the map. And the third uh, uh, part of my presentation is going to be some uh, some emigrant camp locations. Been reading. Um, I've got about oh, six or seven diaries, and been reading the uh, the mileages in the diaries, and kind of uh, and plotted them out on the on the uh, Oregon Trail uh, in, in in this location. Okay, map overlays. Are called. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, the screen is CalTopo mapping software, and uh, in CalTopo the the map the overlays are called map sheets, and they're created from digitized images, JPEGs essentially of other maps that have information on them that doesn't show on the USGS topographical maps or the Forest Service maps, and. Uh, <clears throat> they're, they're also available. Uh, map overlays are also available in. Uh, Ter uh, Train Navigator Pro, but it's an extra uh, subscription. And my target area is going to be this this area near Immigrant uh, Immigrant Springs State Park and and the and the Meacham area. And we broadly here we see the Grand Ron River Valley here with La Grand. Uh, this is the Hill Guard State Park <clears throat> on the Grand Ron River. The uh, Blue Mountain, uh, uh, Blue Mountain Crossing right here, the Interpretive Center, and over here we have Meacham and Lee's Encampment. Up here we have Immigrant Springs State Park, and uh, this this blue arrow here signifies the the top of Immigrant Hill, where the we're down to the Umatilla River here, Hamilton being being over here. First overlay we'll start off with is the uh, Archer Butler Hurlbert uh, <clears throat> uh, map. This comes from the uh, the Crown Collection of American Maps that he that he published in 1920. Zoom it down a little bit and zoom in a bit. And essentially, what what he did was uh, he 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 mapped out the uh, <clears throat> the Oregon Trail from the government land office maps. And zoom in a little bit more, and you can see he's got the Oregon Trail here. He indicates the Foster Toll Road here. This is Meacham Creek and Bear Creek, which is now Beaver Creek. And this is the Meacham and Lee's encampment area. The dotted red line is the uh, is the uh, the National Park Service line for the Oregon Trail, and I think that Okta provided a lot of the uh, 
a, a lot of the data for this. Is is that correct, Dave? Yes. So I have this on here just as a as a, as a reference here. Uh, Emigrant Springs right here. You'll notice that Mr. Herbert uh, puts it over here, which is which is pretty interesting. The CGLO maps don't indicate that, but that's one of the one of the anomalies that you run into when you start looking at all all of these maps. And we'll jump ahead to uh, <clears throat> 1959 with the Oregon State Highway Department maps. This was uh, Earl Bickmore and, and the other uh, state highway engineers were tasked in 56 through, through 1959 with, uh, with mapping the Oregon Trail. And this is uh, what they came up with. <clears throat> You'll note that on this map, he, ha he has some large dots and some small dots through, through all of this area. And let me jump over to <clears throat> And this is the, uh, uh, the, the legend on, on all 10 of the uh, Oregon State Highway Department maps showing the uh, visible portions being the large dots and the uh, just the recorded route being uh, being the small dots. You'll see that through mo through most of this area, we have uh, you know visible ruts through here. Uh, there's a break here, and as we get into Meacham, there's nothing through here. And then finally, uh, in the north of uh, Beaver Creek here, we we have ruts all the way all the way through here till we get to the uh, you know the western just to the west of Emigrant Springs uh, State Park. <clears throat> and I'm gonna turn off this <clears throat> NPS line here because it's, uh, it, it'll show on the, on the, on the overlays. Anyway, if we, <clears throat> if we jump ahead uh, about 12 years to In 1971, we have the uh, National Park Service Comprehensive Management and Use Plan, and <clears throat> this is this is uh, this is their map for that area. <clears throat> and the legend for that map Uh, is right here. <clears throat> Basically, they have ruts as uh, as showing as a dotted line, <clears throat> and the primary route is this uh, is the solid line. So we'll we'll, we'll look for uh, look for, for for dots on this map here, and we're showing uh, <clears throat> the only place that we have dots here is this, uh, this is this location in here, and this is southwest of Emigrant Spring State Park. I'll zoom in a little bit, <clears throat> and there's a uh, there's actually a building out here at the end of a looks like a gravel or dirt road, and I'm going to use this as a reference for some of the other maps that I'll that I'll be showing here. <clears throat> but this seamup map only shows ruts through this area here. So let's go ahead and jump to Percy Brown, basically in the same time frame. Now, uh, uh, Henry and I had a had a discussion about this map because of the the the, the legend. <clears throat> he at one point I think thought that the the the, the solid blue line showed the uh, ruts with good visibility, and the dotted red lines were uh, faintly visible ruts. But I think it's the uh, the the blue line is basically showing the primary route, and the ruts that he found were shown in the, with the dash red line. 
And my reasoning there is that uh, the blue line, the solid blue line, which you can see through here, goes across the entire map. And I don't think even in 1971 uh, or two that the, uh, there were visible ruts across this entire uh, uh, topographic quadrangle. And well, he's got that the whole all the way across all, all of Oregon. The, well, the right, right, Oregon. right. From the Snake River to the Dalles. Yeah. It's a solid blue line. So I think that's just the primary route. You know, without regard to visibility, and the and the red dash lines are the places where he found where he found ruts. Uh, these straight red lines are the flight lines for the uh, for the for the aerial photography that was done at that time. And Percy Brown also shows the uh, uh, the government land office route here too, with the black line here. This is the Oregon Trail through here, uh, and uh, the toll road over here going through this area and he shows this coming up right by uh, uh, Immigrant Springs and in and on north and we'll get to more of that later when we get to the second section uh, of the presentation when we talk about the, uh, uh, the, the surveyor note locations. But let's move on to Aubrey Haynes's map and he pretty much shows the same thing. He does not show the uh, general land office uh, uh, map uh, map line over, over here. And he shows a, a solid black line for the primary route. And he has black dots here for the for the uh, for the ruts that he found. And it, this map also has the flight lines. These are in the same exact location as Percy Brown's map. In fact, everything is pretty much pretty much the same. Uh, it it almost looks like they were both working off the same base map. So <clears throat> I haven't been able to discover where uh, you know those base maps or you know where those it might still be in existence or might be stored. You'll notice here that his uh, his his black dots here which show the which show the ruts. Uh, underneath, you'll see some dashed red lines. So that's part of what makes me think that oh, they were. Okay. Go ahead. Good point. I think you're right. I might be right on that. Yeah. And if we go up here, we can see, you know, underneath here, a couple of dashed lines. So back out a little bit here. And we'll jump 10 years up to Gregory Francois. I'll tone him down a little bit. And his legend. Now he says the uh, material appearing in red in his book incorporate few codes. The wider the two lines is the route, which has been determined rather arbitrarily at times to be the principal route of the Oregon Trail. All of the routes are indicated by lines half that width. The trail line is dotted when pristine or significant rut swales are visible today. So we'll look for dotted lines on his map here and maybe zoom in a little bit on the on our target area here through Meacham. This is a solid through Meacham here. And then when you get uh, 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 <clears throat> the two mile creek area here, you'll see that he has kind of sideways dashes, but I'll we'll take those for dots going up uh, to the uh, to the west of Emigrant Springs State Park. One of the things that I noticed it is it's just all of these authors use uh, uh, show the uh, show the trail being coming through this area and to the west of Emigrant Springs rather than the uh, government land office uh, route that might go up through here, following you know, roughly what's now Highway 30 or even the freeway. And if we go forward another 10 years or so and look at John Evans's map, 
This is from Powerful Rocky. This is his map 3 20. Um, let's take a look at his. his legend here. And uh, he has a solid line for ruts and uh, faintly visible ruts are a dash line and ruts no longer being visible are a, uh, are a dotted line, kind of the reverse of some of the other maps. So we'll look for that uh, solid line on his map of this area. And we don't really see any solid line. We see some dashed lines. This is along, uh, this would be uh, east of, of, of Meacham here along, I think this is called the Weather Bureau Road that goes up to the Weather Bureau site up here. There's some dashes through here for faintly visible, uh, the dots for not being visible. And then we finally have some other dashes here uh, above this road, above Beaver Creek here. And again, following this, uh, this, this line out here going west of Emigrant Spring State Park, he has some dashes in this area. And note also our target, uh, <clears throat> our building right here is just in the same location here. And then in the, in, this is the southwest uh, quarter section, section 29. And some more uh, faintly visible ruts in the uh, the northwest quarter section of 29, and also up here in the southwest quarter section of section 20. So pretty uh, pretty pretty interesting stuff. Looking at uh, um, you know looking at. Uh, you know the different authors and, and where they where they have the Oregon Trail line, but but also where they show that there are were visible ruts at the time that they that they publish. And now what I want to do is show some just just the uh, just the uh, these are just the ruts off of the various maps here. This is showing the. Um, The Oregon State Highway Division in 1959 publication shows visible ruts clear across this area. Emigrant Spring State Park being here in the top middle and Meacham just out of the picture in the bottom right. And then if we go uh, 10 years and look at the National Park Service Comprehensive Management and Use Plan in 71, we show that there are only ruts in this area. You'll see the green on the map here. Moving another 10 years forward to Gregory Francois, we show that he has ruts going across the entire, the entire area. So I'm gonna remove this and this. So we don't block the other. Here's Percy Brown's ruts. Add Aubrey Haynes. And add John Evans. So it looks like at least, uh, uh, you know, three of these authors really, really agree on where visible ruts are. The uh, comprehensive management of use plan only shows them in this area and not up here. Uh, I'm not sure why, why that is, but that's what the map show. Robin, um, I think you're aware. I don't think that Haynes and Francois actually uh, visited much of Oregon. They visited a few places. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Haynes, I, I didn't mean to include Haynes. And now I'm confused. Uh, right. I think they're basically copying each other, you know, rather than original research. I guess yeah. that's what I was trying to say. 
Yeah, Dave, this is Roger. I joined late here, but um, Greg once told me that uh, when he got to Oregon, he was, I don't know whether it was time situation or what, but he relied on a lot of the local information that was already out there for Oregon. So I, I would use Greg's with a grain of salt, uh, but you're right. It, it's that. I don't know about Haynes. I think Haynes looked fairly closely with uh, Percy Brown. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So the question I would have is, is which authors actually walk the ground? So, uh, yeah, we, we know, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the first, uh, first person we looked at was the Oregon State Highway Division, uh, Earl Bickmore. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think that he probably did walk the ground, but <clears throat> I've not been able to discover any, you know, any documentation for any of that. Uh, I have a three page letter that he wrote to uh, probably his boss explaining what his methods were. He used uh, several, uh, he had 11 pioneer diaries and uh, he said that in this area, the, um, you know, the, the uh, government land office records were really confusing, what with the Oregon Trail and the toll road and you know, other wagon roads, and that he relied on the diaries as the kind of the, the, the last resort for, for determining where the trail went. And the Blue Mountains was one of the two areas, that and Burnt River, where he, where he you know, thought that the, it was you know, very, very confusing. So uh, none, of the, none of the trail diaries that I've read really have much information on where, you know, where, where they went. They give mileages for each day generally, but they don't say anything like, well, I left Lee's encampment and I went directly west and crossed the crossed Meacham Creek and then went in a northwesterly direction, uh, you know, or anything like that. They don't give that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of information. Robin, this is Lee. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the NPS 1971 Comprehensive Management Plan. Um, I'm not sure what you're looking at there because um, Park Service wouldn't have done a, a comprehensive management plan until the trail was designated. Um, and that didn't happen until I think 78. So um, I'm wondering what, what is the exact document you're looking at? Yeah, let me see here. Um... Uh, I, my maps say that it's 1981 and the printed, okay. printed file or printed okay. document I have. It. Yeah, that makes sense. That so makes it was 1981. Sense. So it was in yeah. the in the in the range of uh, Gregory Francois's re research. Yeah, and then um, the original feasibility study was in 1977, and I'm just checking here, see what kind of maps. There might have been with that. I'm sure there were maps, and I'm I. My understanding is that those feasibility study maps, which was evaluating the trail for designation as a national strike trail, that that was based on Haynes's work. Yeah, I have the the. Uh, this is August eighty one, the uh, appendix two of the comprehensive management and use plan, and it's 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 uh, all maps. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. but feasibility study would predate that, and that's from, um, I think I said seventy-seven. Okay, so I've 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 got the date wrong. This should read uh, this should read nineteen eighty-one. Okay, and if you want, I can see if I can make the original feasibility study available to you. But as I said, I think that was all Haynes's work anyway. Okay. Now, does it, would that have more information about them actually walking the trail? Oh, I doubt it, but we could look. <laughs> okay. Any other comments, questions? All right, we're going to move on to the second part of the presentation, which are the The surveyor notes.
And let's see, we'll do some township boundaries here. Our target area is there. Hopefully I'm not making everyone dizzy. But this is the, uh, you know, the, the general area. Here's the Grand Ronde Valley here, uh, Umatilla River and Pendleton up here. And uh, the Willamette Baseline goes across here. This is Township 1 North, 35 East, 1 South, and on down here. And I, I've been over, went over the surveyor notes for these two townships. Township 1 North, 35 East, and Township 1 South, 35 East. And uh, <clears throat> There's a good reference for what the surveyors actually did in uh, Jim Tompkins' uh, article, uh, Law of the Land in the Overland Journal in the fall of 2001. If you want to you know, read more about what the, you know, the surveys and how they were actually done. But basically, uh, uh, <clears throat> the surveys were, were, were contracted out uh, to various contractors and, and, and they did the, uh, the surveys generally over a summer and fall and they kept a, uh, kept a notebook. And the notebook, they, they hand numbered the, the pages and wrote down all the details of what they, um, you know, of, of, of the different uh, items that they, that they encountered. And let me see here, I've got a somewhere here. There's the CMUP map that I used, Meacham, Oregon. Yeah, here we go. This is a typical uh, surveyor note page here. This is for uh, 1 North 35 East. And his handwritten page numbers up here. When the notebook got back to the, uh, the government land office, uh, usually in Oregon, I think during this period, it was Eugene City. Uh, they, they put a stamped page number on it. And now when you go out to the BLM website and you call and you look at these surveyor notes, the stamped page number is part of the file name for this particular image of the surveyor notebook. But he's going, you say north between sections 32 and 33, uh, at 40 chains, which is the quarter section boundary, he sets a, a post eight feet long, three inches in square, 24 inches in the ground. And they give uh, some uh, compass directions and, and, and distances for a couple of uh, pine tree and a tamarack tree for witness posts, I guess. And then at uh, 78 chains, he, the, they encounter what, it, what they call an old stage road running northwest and southeast. And then at 80 chains, they set, uh, he set a basalt stone, 12 by 10 by eight inches. And uh, again, we have four, four witness, witness trees there. So that's a typical, typical surveyor's notebook page. And if you're lucky, when you're going through surveyor notes, you'll find an index like this. And this is just one of the one of the images on the BLM website, but this shows uh, uh, you know a schematic of the township, starting with section one here and ending with 36 down here. But he's uh, he's he's uh, penciled in uh, what what page numbers each of these section lines is. Unfortunately, when you go to look through the uh, uh, through the surveyor su surveyor notes, uh, what's really useful is to have the uh, have the page number for the for the government land office stamped page number, and that and that's not on here. But this is uh, this is this is very helpful. And here's another. Uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, part of the part of the field notebooks. You see, part of it is actually printed. But uh, this is uh, James Kern and James Nolan. And this is in, the, uh, uh, this in, in, in our area here in 1887. They, they started in June and ended in August, but he had a compass man 
three chain men and two ax men. So uh, <clears throat> chain men were probably, I'm not exactly sure how they, uh, how they, uh, how they did it, but he probably had two chains. That's why he's got four chain. Men. <clears throat> and a couple of ax men for blazing, uh, removing anything that needs to be anything that needs to be removed out of the way. Okay, so first thing I did was I categorized all of these notes when I got it all compiled uh, and color coded them. The first one category would be emigrant roads. Whenever the uh, a surveyor uh, noted that uh, it was the old emigrant road or, or emigrant road, uh, you know, I, I I categorize those and show them here. And you'll note that these uh, uh, these locations are all in Township One South, Range Thirty Five East. Uh, this is Emigrant Spring State Park here. And here is the that's Lee's encampment, according to Evans and Meacham right here. And you'll see that this goes these these uh, surveyor locations, and this is where the old emigrant road or emigrant road crossed a section line. Now this, this light green area here is an 1864 survey. So some of these are fairly early, like this one, uh, David Thompson and Daniel Chaplin, Old Emigrant Road, course Northwest, 40.6 chains east of the section corner. And here's the, here's the typical uh, uh, file name of the, of the, uh, of the survey, survey note, uh, uh, image on the BLM web, website. And that will be stamped page 43 and 31 is the uh, the surveyors uh, handwritten handwritten note. Now if we add uh, uh, those survey note locations that are marked toll road, they're either marked toll road or sometimes um, Foster's toll road we'll see that these are also all in this one township. And they roughly parallel the immigrant road to, to the west. Now if we add, uh, there's also a, a, a series of Survey locations that are marked where the road is marked Pendleton Legrand Wagon Road. And you'll note that these are all in the next township north, Township 1 North Range 35 East. Now keep in mind that this, this, uh, this survey here with the dark green border, this is a uh, uh, survey done in 1887. So uh, the light green here was the 1864 survey. Uh, this red is actually kind of a target area. Uh, and this, this, this township up here, uh, one north range 35 east was surveyed in 1887. So a little bit later. So if we look at it, from kind of a 50,000 foot view. We could see roughly a, you know, a, a line across there. And let's see, let me add the, 
There's our dashed line for the park service route. Fairly close. Again, we'll note that it goes out over here east of Emigrant Spring State Park and not, not through, say, through this area here right by Emigrant Springs. Okay, in our fourth category, um, the uh, <clears throat> Surveyors uh, uh, noted uh, a number of other roads. Sometimes they'll call them uh, old roads, old wagon roads, old stage road. You know, that's uh, that that sort of thing. And we'll add those in, and we get a whole bunch of those. And these are all from '82 and '87. You'll see, there's a whole whole passel of uh, of uh, of road locations that they noted. Did you miss it? And if we kind of uh, focus on this Meacham Immigrant Springs area, this for instance is a wagon road, east and west. Okay, noted by James Kern and James Nolan on their survey in 1887. Uh, this in here is an old stage road. There's another old stage road, again, Kern and Nolan in 1887. And this out here, which is reasonably close to the, uh, the Park Service line here, is uh, Wagon Road North. One of the things that struck me about in doing this is that um, if we follow the National Park Service line here, we don't have any, any surveyor notes for anything in this area. All we have is the old stage road here. And we have this, uh, this notation here for a wagon road. And as we go east of Emigrant Springs, through this area, we have we have nothing in this in this area here. The closest we have is over here on the freeway, old stage road. And this seems to rather fall in line with uh, with this note location, and this note location, and this note location. Now keep in mind that these uh, surveyor note locations are all on section lines. They didn't, they didn't uh, you know, randomly survey uh, you know, by just walking around. They followed, this, they followed and measured uh, section lines. So whatever they found along that section line is what they put, is what they put in their notebooks. And there's things from you know, when they crossed a creek, they, 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 they noted what direction it was, it was running in and how many lengths across it was. And that sort of uh, that sort of information. So they were, uh, were were quite detailed, but that's kind of the, some of the anomalies that I found, you know, in in, in this area looking at these uh, 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 surveyor notes. Any comments or questions? Robin, this is John Winter. Which of your surveyor notes are indicated immigrant road or immigrant trail? Uh, the red. The red ones are, okay. Yeah. And they were only down in this township one south range 35 east. That would be south of Meacham. Meacham is right here. And which ones are old road? Uh, just, just plain old road or old wagon road or the blue. It also includes old, old uh, stage road. The purple here is the, is the toll road. Sometimes it's labeled Foster's Toll Road. 
1864 note says just toll road bears southeast and northwest. But if we go down to uh, say this location for the 1887 or 1882 survey, it says Foster's Toll Road. And I don't know who Foster was, but he had a toll road apparently. And getting up in uh, you know north of uh, uh, north of Meacham here through the <clears throat> the Immigrant Springs uh, State Park area and on to uh, uh, Escopa Overlook and Dead Man's Pass over in, over in this area, uh, we have the Pendleton and Legrand Wagon Road. But this was another five years later. He seemed fairly consistent going through here. I mean, it, it appears to me that uh, although there's still some notes you can't quite uh, explain, we can't quite explain that by eight, the 1860s and the 1880s, that the route through the area had moved to approximately where later US 30 was developed and, and Interstate 84. Um, that the the red line that moves off to the to the west there, you know, it's kind of a shortcut to go along the US 30 route or the freeway route. Now that does you, that doesn't explain all of your surveyors' notes, so there's still some anomalies, right? Yeah, and and why 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 this uh, the the Park Service route out here. And actually, I call it the Park Service route, but this is the uh, uh, the Oregon uh, the Oregon State Highway Department Earl Bickmore route. Yes, I I think that's the way it should be described. And it's yeah. actually a lot of the data that's uh, we used on the map was from Hornbuckle and his crew who went out and put markers along the, a lot of this area in the in the 1990s, but. Right, and and I don't know, you know, I have some of those locations from Chuck. But they're in this lower area here. In fact, I can show those to you here. Yeah, they did a combination of uh, marking in the field and, and some of them are just marks on a map. Okay, now these are the ones that I got from him. This is the lower, these are kind of from, uh, from, from the Legrand here. This, Blue square here is Bernie Park, and this is uh, Hillgard State Park on the Grand Ronde, and this is the Blue uh, Blue Mountain Crossing area here. I had assumed that they that these were all Octomarker so, uh, sites, and they uh, obviously had to walk it to put the markers in. Most of it they did. Okay. No, but I have are... a complete set, which does run through the area that you've been studying. Um, okay. Do you, I do you I, have... Yeah, I thought I'd given that to you. Why don't you send those to me again, and I'll stick those on this map. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the GPS locations for all of it. I had a, uh, a report that I got from Chuck, but it only covered this lower area here, not through okay. this area here. Yeah, I'll send you what I have. All right. So that'll... Uh, but it is Chuck's data. Yeah. Okay. That off. Okay. Moving on to the third part of the presentation. And this is actually kind of a, a little more fun. Oh, there's a, I forgot to show my typical surveyor's map here. But you've all seen these before. This is showing the emigrant road here and the, and the toll road coming just to the west. This is the 1864 survey in, uh, in uh, right by Meacham. One of the things that I did in, and in, in, in this is uh, true, I think of uh, well, at least all the mapping softwares that, that I've used, and it's certainly true of CalTopo, uh, is that you can, get, if, you, if you have a track, 
uh, you know, on a map, you can get a profile. And this is the profile of the, of the, of the, of the route over the Blue Mountains from Grand Ronde Valley at Grand on the left at mile zero to the Umatilla River on the bottom right at mile 42. And some of the, some of the, uh, <clears throat> some of the, some of the locations, Hillgard State Park at mile seven and a half, Blue Mountain Crossing mile 15, He's encampment at Meacham at mile 25. Uh, this is the hilltop west of Emigrant Springs, about 29.5. Uh, the Dead Man's uh, uh, Pass red rest stop, 35.5. And the drop to the Umatilla at, uh, at uh, 42. First uh, diary that I went over was for uh, was for Joel Palmer. In 1845. And he showed uh, on the, uh, the 12th of September, we traveled seven miles. Across the Grand Ronde and ended up here at Bernie Park. And then he, uh, on the next day, September 13th, he traveled about seven miles. And he, uh, he says this day we traveled about seven miles from Grand Ronde. The road ascends the Blue Mountains. Two miles is quite steep and precipitous. The road is very stony. At the end of four miles, it takes down the mountain to Grand Ronde River. One mile in distance then crosses. Here's another bottom covered with grass and bushes where we pitched our encampment. So his first camp was at uh, basically Emigrant Springs State Park. And I arrived at these, let's see, let me go to another. My trail mileages document here, Joe Palmer. And I went over the, uh, the, the diary for each day and I kind of in, in red, I put the number of miles that they say that they, that they went. And uh, my comments were in blue. And at the end, I at the total mileage, okay? Uh, if you add up all of Joel Palmer's mileages, it comes to 42 miles, which is exactly what the, uh, you know, what the, our, our dash red line says. On, day, on the next day, traveled about 10 miles. And we could follow these on the, the profile here. About seven, uh, you know, seventeen and a half miles is where he camped. And sometimes, uh, with the with the trail mileages, sometimes they're pretty uh, they're pretty they're pretty accurate, and other times they don't seem to be. And that's why I added up the mileages uh, on these trail diaries to see what their total mileage was. You know, if they said that they went from Grand Ronde Valley to Umatilla River and it was 50 miles, then and said it was 50 miles, then I know that they overestimated their mileage per day. And if it was, you know, 30, 35 miles, they underestimated. But generally, they were pretty uh, fairly, fairly accurate. Here's his, his camp at Immigrant at, uh, <clears throat> at uh, uh, Hill Guard State Park. And it, it looks like, let me show you the next map here. Here's Joel Palmer on the, on the mm -hmm. profile here. Grand Ron Valley at mile zero here in Hill Guard. He, wants, he says seven miles. This is seven and a half miles on our profile and camped on the mountain here on the 14th 
and then ended up at Lee's and Canton. So in general, the uh, people uh, did, did camp at the base of the mountain here at La Grande, at least the, the seven people in my diaries did, and uh, made it over here to the uh, camp at Hillgard, you know, over the mountain here the first day. And the second day, they camped somewhere on the mountain here, a dry camp, or there was a, uh, you know, a creek or spring off to the, uh, you know, down in a ravine off to the side of the trail where they had to go a quarter to a half a mile to, to get water and haul it back to camp. And then on the third day, they made Lee's encampment or somewhere uh, uh, around that area. And, and, and the fourth day over to the Umatilla River. If we go to our next, <clears throat> next pioneer, Absalom Hardin in 1847, this is a couple of years later, you see that his camps are pretty much in the same area. He made it a little bit further on the, uh, uh, on the second day. But here's Hillgard, Lee's encampment, Uatilla River. Here we have a hill guard camp on the mountain. Over here we have Lee's and Cameron at Meacham. Here's Emigrant Springs, and then down to the Umatilla River. Interesting what he says on when he left, uh, when he left Hillguard, we started and traveled 10 miles. You will take care to fill your kegs in the morning for you will not find a drop for 10 miles. Oh, this is, uh, this is the next, this is the next day traveling to, uh, to Lee's encampment where he, where he camped on the mountain. This, this point is called Lee's encampment. The day before, We camped on the mountain one and a half miles to the left and down the mountain we found water in a small branch so the water stands in pools. So that was typical of camping uh, somewhere in the uh, say the Blue Mountain Crossing. Blue Mountain Crossing is at mile 15 right here so they were just beyond that. So usually they, they uh, had, a, had a dry camp in that area. Okay, let me go to the next. And this is Philemon Crawford. And as we get uh, later and later, uh, they seem to be to be able to travel a little bit further each day. He started out uh, on on the uh, at, 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 at Le Grand and went over. This is uh, Hillgard, and he went all the way to a camp near Pelican Creek. 11.5, and this may be the site that Evan shows on his maps as being a couple of miles beyond, beyond Hillgard. Again, they camped on the mountain, and uh, Lee's encampment is at mile 25, and he went another couple of miles to about the area of Two Mile Creek. Emigrant Springs is right about here. Close the door. I can, I can hear that. I had the door shut. You want to mute yourself so we don't hear you? Okay. This is PV Crawford showing his, his, his locations across there. And then we have Abigail Jane Scott. Camped at uh, <clears throat> Le Grand, came over actually beyond uh, beyond Hillgard to camp at the, the what I call the Evans Camp, and made it quite a bit further the next day, but still camped on the mountain. 
and then camped a little beyond Lee's encampment at Two Mile Creek before heading to the uh, to the Umatilla River. Let's zoom in a little bit on, on some of this here. Um, some of the uh, <clears throat> some of the pioneer mileages are are rather flexible. When we get to our next person, which I think is uh, uh, no, not the when we get to Cornelia Sharp, uh, we'll see that her mileages are really flexible. She'll say, you know, we went ten to twelve miles today. Well. That's a, there's a, quite a bit of leeway in 10 to 12 miles. But here's the uh, hill guard area here on the Grand Ron coming up over and uh, Abigail Jean Scott camped about here. Zoom in there. There's some springs here. And uh, Evans in his book, Powerful Rocky, uh, shows a campground in, in this area. And it, it appears as though quite a number of the, uh, the emigrants, if they went beyond Hillguard, would camp over here on the springs. Okay, and let's see, she camped on the mountain again. following, you know, roughly the ridges by Pelican Creek here, just west of Pelican Creek, past Blue Mountain Crossing. Past the Mount Emily interchange here, this is Road 31. And somewhere in this area. <clears throat> Again, the, the mileage is, uh, um, you know, very, very so much. Uh, sometimes it's possible to kind of pin down where a camp was by, uh, by referring to the trail, uh, the, the mileage for the next day. Like this, this camp might not be, you know, you <clears throat> might be a, in, a, in a location that's pretty approximate. But if it says, you know, we did the, the, the next day, we went X number of miles to Lee's encampment, then you can measure back from that uh, known location and, and, and pinpoint, the, <clears throat> pinpoint the, uh, the location where they camped the day before. And I have her, uh, right up in here on Two Mile Creek. Two Mile Creek comes through here and comes down along Highway 30 here and hits Meacham Creek and Meacham right about in here somewhere. John Tully Kearns in 1852, he started off at the at, at Legrand, and then went all the way to this Evans camp, two two and a half miles beyond uh, uh, beyond Hillguard here, and then he made it the next day all the way to Lee's encampment. So 15 miles, a pretty rough road, but this was in 1852. This is another seven years after Joel Palmer uh, made his journey. Robin, you. This is Gail. You talk about the, this Evans camp. I went out there with Jack Evans in, in, the, in the 1990s, I guess. Yeah. And there were all kinds of uh, artifacts laying in the bottom of the creek bed. Yeah. This, this goes up a pretty steep hill. And there's no water in there. So this is an excellent camp. There was lots of evidence of, uh, of people having camped there. Yeah, yeah. And this, uh, you know, the, the diaries that I've looked at, it looks like, uh, you know, several of the seven that I've, that I've looked at in, in detail uh, did, in fact, appear to camp there. 
Now, if they didn't just come over the, uh, over the mountain from La Grande and camp at Hillgard, they would camp, they, would, they could camp here. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a speculation on my part, but it, it seems like uh, as we go forward in time, uh, maybe it's possible that the road got better and they could make a, a little bit better mileage. But that seems to be, uh, seems to be uh, the case here. He camped here, but uh, the, previous, uh, 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 the previous immigrants have all camped somewhere up here on the mountain in a dry camp where they had to go down to water and haul water up from a, from a, from a creek, you know, quarter to a half a mile. But if you can get from this, uh, this camp here where there were springs all the way to Lee's encampment at Meacham, then you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to haul water. And you can make it from, from Lee's encampment all the way down to the Umatilla the next day. A little bit more, a uh, little bit more efficient. Let's see. Yeah, and here we'll come to Cornelius Sharp. And um, this is kind of a, uh, she's a kind of a special case here. Her, her mileages are, for a couple of the days, are 10 to 12 miles, and another day it's seven to eight miles. So uh, it's what, what, what I call flexible. Uh, she did not camp at La Grande. They were, they camped, uh, a little, a little bit short of there, somewhere along. Um, uh, let me go back to the map here. Okay. Somewhere in here, this is uh, Legrand in the top left. Somewhere in here, our camp was near a spring about six miles in the valley. And uh, I have a reference here. Let me show the, here we go. This is the trail from now, this is actually from Farewell Bend all the way over here. There was an alternate route along the base of the mountain here at some point. I think I got this line from Evans, and this is from the, the, the Park Service line. And at some point, they, <clears throat> they merged, but she camped somewhere in here. So the next day, she was going up over the mountain here, west of the Grand, down the hill to Hillgard, but then continuing on and going over here to the, what I call the Evans camp here. Now, I, uh, the last couple of years, I've wanted to get out here and do some exploration. And I, and I did do some, but uh, Blue Mountain Crossing has been closed. So I couldn't really walk uh, the road there. Uh, and a lot of it, uh, the other parts are in private land. So I couldn't do that, but I did do some exploration here. A couple of days I went up and, and, and walked this part where the, where the road comes down off of the top down into Hillgard. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Okay. Now she made it to the Evans camp and, but they didn't, she didn't, they didn't make it all the way to Lee's encampment at 25 miles. They still had to camp on the mountain. And she is the only, uh, the only one where I can, you know, I, I, th I think reasonably say that she did actually camp at Emigrant Springs. And uh, that's because of her mileage the next day. 
okay, from say mile 30 here to 42, about 12 miles. And she says, This day we traveled seven or eight miles, camped on an opening, the timber grass planted an excellent spring. And the next day they went 12 miles, which brought us to the Valley of the Umatilla. So subtracting uh, 12 from 42, you get mile 30, which is about Emigrant Springs. Opening in the timber grass plenty and an excellent spring. So that's what makes me think she in fact did camp at Emigrant Springs. The mileages are the mileages are good. Our final final pioneer is George Belshaw. This is fifty three. This is the next year. Uh, pretty typical. The Grand over the hill, the Hill Guard, and he made it all the way from Hill Guard to uh, to Lee's encampment. Actually, a little a little little bit beyond probably that two mile creek area, but didn't go as far as Emigrant Springs, which would be over here. So he's probably, what, uh, 19 miles, something like that, that day. And then the next day, all the way down to the Umatilla River. Questions, comments? I had, no idea, I had no idea that there was this much backup data on this section. So many, so many people documented their journey. Pretty incredible. Well, yeah, this is just uh, this is just seven of the of, of of the diaries that I looked at in detail. Uh, generally, they <laughs> gave their mileage for each day. And sometimes they, uh, you know, they broke it down. You know, we went up this hill one and a half miles, and then we went up this other even steeper hill for half a mile because we had to double team. And, and then we went two miles to another place where we camped and we had to, you know, go down into the ravine for water, you know, that sort of thing. So they give their mileage. Was, and, this, uh, was this their entire journey from when they left? They did it on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, pretty much, yeah. I mean, the the the, the, diary, the diaries vary, of course. Some of them stop at some point, you know. They just, you know, somebody just got too busy or tired or whatever and didn't, uh, you know, didn't continue the diary. But but generally, that's the case. Um, I used um, Stephen Dow Beckham's a couple of publications his uh, uh, for for diary references, and sometimes I went to the actual diary because they're still available. See uh, uh, on the Octa on the you know the Octa website, and uh, some of them are available on the Internet Archive. Um, I've actually purchased some. You know you can get uh, some of the old uh, Pioneer transactions from uh, you know the late 1800s through the you know the early 1900s of, <clears throat> of, of their annual meetings, and they'll have diaries published in those. And I, uh, I actually bought one of those on, on eBay and, uh, you know, and, and, and got the diary that way. But I'm just going over the diary entries for the Blue Mountains, you know, kind of for this project. Um, <clears throat> another, uh, I had a, um, I also, um, and it's too bad he couldn't, uh, uh, you know, make, make this, uh, this uh, Zoom Zoom meeting, but uh, Stafford Hazlitt. I also asked him about, uh, you know, what are some good diaries for travel over over this, and he gave me some suggestions. And we had a, a multi-day email exchange over some of these uh, some of these some some of the some of the diaries. Some of the early people, uh, when they crossed the Blue Mountains, they actually followed. Uh, the route that Fremont later took by coming down the valley here to say to Elgin and then over this way through Tollgate and down. 
I think I have Fremont. Yeah, I saw this I got from uh, uh, from uh, Evans's powerful Rocky. Uh, the red line is purely speculative. Uh, I think they went over here rather than up here. Over, over, over toll, over toll gate, and then down this way. But if you look at this, this was um, who was the pioneer, the early pioneer, in the, that that went over, went over this way. It was another. Um, it was Madorm Crawford. Now Madorm Crawford went over in about. Uh, I. It was early, early, it, it was 42. It was before the uh, National Oregon Trail. And uh, he went over this way. He had another couple of trips in 1862. He went back to New York to visit his father. And he, and, and he went over and back then. And also in 1865, those later trips, he did come over this way. But his first trip out, he, they, they came this way. And if you, a careful reading of his diary shows that that's what he did. He got into the valley, <clears throat> he camped on a creek, okay? And then they were met by a couple of Indians with trapping gear. And uh, he said they put, the, he, they put, the Indians put him on the, <clears throat> the company's trail. And by companies, I think he meant uh, Hudson Bay Company. But they, they, they went across the valley and they came to the same creek that they had camped on and followed it down. Well, in the Grand Ronde Valley, down means toward Elgin, toward this way. And the Hudson's Bay Company Trail came over the mountains, came over the mountains here. And I have a, a, a publication from... Uh, uh, Hudson's Bay Society of, of, of Peter Skeen Ogden's and it has maps in it and it shows the shows their route coming up from uh, Fort Nez Perce up the Umatilla and across across this way. And if you read in Peter Skeen Ogden's diary <clears throat> early on they did come over somewhere here but he said this was really stony it was really rocky and stony and they uh, they had discovered this area coming up the the Umatillan coming across here, and it was much, uh, much gentler and, and, and far less, uh, far less rugged. That was in the 18, 1826-1827 time frame. So there's a lot of information, <clears throat> you know, in in the diaries, and if you get out the map and start plotting. Uh, you know, you you can't always be accurate because the diaries aren't aren't that accurate. Like I say, none of them say none, none of them say. Um, um, you know, we went out of camp and we went west for half a mile, and then we went northwest for two miles, and they don't give directions; they just have mileage. So, and the reason I plotted them on this red dotted line, they. Uh, National Park Service line or the in, in our kind of in my target area, the Earl Bickmore line is just just to be consistent. Robin. Yeah, uh, this this is Steve Ludeman and I have a question on um, the first the first part of your presentation where you talked about the uh, National Park Service and the Earl Bickmore line and Southwest, you indicated on your map, southwest of Immigrant Springs, there were still some uh, wagon ruts in those areas. Are those, are those visible today? I don't know. Again, this is, uh, this is uh, private land. Okay. So, um, you know, I haven't, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't hiked out there. Okay. Yeah, so I so I don't know. I just uh, going over all of the maps, you know, you kind of see, uh, you know, here's 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 visible ruts clear across this whole area, and then ten years later, uh, you know, they mostly disappear, and then in another ten years, there they are again, you know. And I think that people are just sort of copying each other as time goes through. They uh, 
the the Oregon State Highway Department uh, route is really what people have settled on, you know, in this area, and all of the authors pretty much stick with that stick with that route. Mm -hmm. The, uh, do, we, do, we, do we know anything about the history of uh, logging in that area? Has there been extensive logging between the 1950s and the present time in, in the areas where we're looking at that route? Uh, boy, that would be, you know, that would be like a Forest Service question. And, right. and, and I don't know. I do know. Let's see. Let me show you. Uh, <clears throat> some parcel data here by owners. Some of these, um, and we'll, okay, uh, here just west of the, uh, <clears throat> west of Emigrant Spring State Park, here's a parcel here. This is mm -hmm. kind of the area in question. This is owned by Boston Timber Opportunities, LLC. Mm -hmm. So that tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And some of these areas, um, let's see, let me get the right map here. Um, let's see, I have to take my shading off and my Forest Service topo off. This is the scan topos. These are probably from uh this is the usgs topo map from probably the early 60s with some uh you know they they, <clears throat> they did do some photo revisions in the early 1980s but this shows this area notice the green is the uh the <clears throat> vegetation overlay notice this whole piece of property here right okay and that's now owned by the John Hancock Life Insurance Company. Well, before that, it was owned by somebody else. You know, who knows? That looks like they went in and clear cut that. Is what it looks like to me. I mean, that's pretty, it's awfully square. But, you know, I, you know, again, I'm speculating. Robin? Yeah. This is Susan Doyle. Um, have you contacted Dave Powell with the new property next to the Presbyterian Church that they've extended theirs down here in the lower lower middle? Yeah. Um, and they want to interpret it. They have good ruts in the, through there. Right. And I'm involved with Lee in, the, in, in that project, too. Okay, I, good, I, good. I, I didn't want to specifically address that. In this oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, yeah, eventually there will be an area people can see. And that here, if we go to, let's do, I'll take, uh, we don't need Fremont anymore. And if we put our surveyor notes back in. Hmm. We can see the where the surveyors found ruts in that area. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, some sort of a road. Again, this over here is just a wagon road going north, an old stage road going northwest. These are both stage roads going across here. Old stage road, northwest and southeast. And this is just a uh, wagon road, northwest. Right along the pipeline. <clears throat> now if you, and this is, okay. Yeah. Now, if we go in on, say, Google Maps, let me take off the parcel data so we don't, you know, we can see this area here along the pipeline. Um, but over here, I mean, we've got roads all over the place. 
Yeah. And if you go through here, there's roads here, here. This looks like it's almost an, uh, an ATV playground. <laughs> uh, good areas here, there's roads through here, some buildings here. Uh, you know, you've got roads all over the place. So I don't know what to say about that. Do you think it's possible that some of those stage roads could have been wagon trail before the stage coaches started uh, developing or using them? Yeah, it's hard. Um, you know, it, it's it's hard to say if you uh, these particular lines here. If you go to the actual map, let me see if I can find the. survey maps here. Yeah, here we are. This is the uh, one north range 35 east. Uh, <clears throat> The way they drew them on the map is here they are here. Here's, here's that old road going north right here. Mm -hmm. Here's these, the stage roads right here, and this old wagon road here. But on the uh, as they drew them on the map, they're sort of orphaned. In other words, where did this road go? It didn't right. cross, it didn't cross this section line because they would have noted a road. It didn't cross this section line because well, the same thing. Where did they go from here? That's why I used the surveyor notes to, for, the, for the road locations and didn't use the maps because the cartographer back at the government land office, probably Eugene City here, uh, oh, Portland, Oregon, June 14th, 1890, you know, drew in roads here. But the surveyors themselves didn't verify that there was a road across here. Right. They just verified that they saw a road here and they saw a road here. And these things like like a prairie here, how did that, you know, they, they probably crossed a prairie going up this section line, okay? And this is the pendleton Legrand wagon road out here and part of the emigrant road here. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that's an open question. It would seem like it's uh, an, uh, the key question is, are there any remnants that we can find along the red dash line here? Uh, if, if, and that wasn't apparent when you showed any of the uh, aerial images that there was any remaining disturbance, but it may be buried in the trees like other sites. But it seems like uh, determining if we can find any evidence in that area. And if you can't, then you start thinking more about those stage roads. Yeah, but, you know, um, <clears throat> I don't know the, see the, 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 the emigrant road here, you know, is shown by the red, the red ones sh show a, a continuity, shall we say. And the Foster's Toll Road here shows a continuity. Right. No, I agree with you on that. Yeah, and the, the and, and and likewise with the Pendleton Le Grand uh, Wagon Road, these are all just sort of except for some of these which are right along uh, Highway 30, and the freeway kind yeah. of fall in line with those. But these are just sort of out out in space, you know. Like yeah. some of these roads over here, old road. There's northwest and east. Yeah. Well, it's down and toward the bottom of the of, of the creek here, and likewise over here, wagon road. You know, again, this is uh, you know 1880. Well, this would have been 1882, so fairly late. Uh, <clears throat> what were people What were people out there doing that they would have built roads? Um, 
uh, probably Meacham had people living in it. Um, I don't know. There could have been ranches at different places. Um, there could have been logging. Um, I know on some of the, especially the 1882 and the 1887 surveys, they show, and the surveyors note the uh, the railroad survey that that eventually went through Meacham and then down Meacham Creek. Uh, you know, they would have needed uh, railroad ties, so there might have been activities for you know to do to do to do that and to just for building in you know Pendleton and LeGrand come up in the mountains to cut trees and bring the you know bring the logs down and in uh, you know for uh, for lumber to, for to build houses so I don't know you know there might have been uh, you know cattle grazing sheep grazing but th that wouldn't necessarily mean that people would have roads well, I think the road that swings to the west uh, is probably the easiest route you could get through the area if you weren't going to take time to build roads. But as soon as they started building roads and making improvements, then the road moves over to where I-84 and, and US-30 are. But, you know, the first route is look for the easiest way to go, not necessarily the shortest. And the, right, the route along US-30 and Eighty four is the shortest. Yeah, if you look at this line here, here we have. Um, yeah, let me kind of zoomed in a little too much here. Coming from Meacham and Lee's encampment here, coming over this way and up, uh, pretty reasonable so so far. But here you have it going up a hill. Yeah, right. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. And then no. down through this gully and around right. here. And then around, you kind of get on the top. There's a, a, there's a hill crest here. Uh, there's a hill crest here. Uh, and here, a little knob here that shows a hill crest here in the top. And we go through here. Uh, it doesn't fit in with, say, uh, yeah. you know, camping at Emigrant Springs. You're six tenths of a mile to the west. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's why I, I, you know, I, I would really like to get, you know, say er, Earl Bickmore's notes that he had them. The only, yeah. the nearest uh, thing that I can come to is that uh, <clears throat> that he he actually kept all of those himself, <clears throat> and, and that Jack Evans may have. Uh, uh, I think Jack Evans used those when he produced his powerful Rocky book, but where they ended up, who knows. You know, I had a email conversation that included, uh, you know, Stafford Hazlitt, and um, um, you know, I asked him about. He mentioned a, a confidential archive, but he wouldn't tell us where it was hmm. because it's confidential. Uh, so, you know, it was a, a a dead end. I've I even found Earl Bitmore's grandson on Facebook. You know, and, and Steve Bingle did some did some work kind of tracking, you know, what, what, what he, he, you know, his his relatives, maybe there was somebody still in the still in the, you know, Oregon area that might know something, but they're all dead ends. Robin, could you show that uh, surveyor's map again that we were looking at a few minutes ago? Yeah, let's see. Um, okay, so I'm wondering, um, see the, the wagon route right to the right of your cursor. Yeah, and it comes up and it turns west. Could that connect with those remnants to the left? Is there some kind of geological feature there, topographical feature, where it says 80, looks like 80,000 there? Yeah, that's 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 eighty. That's measuring the uh, the number of chains across the section. Okay, so um, instead, where the where that tees, where that road tees, could it have continued west and gone around some hilltop or feature, and uh, connected with those remnants? Um, yeah, the, the the map you know obviously doesn't show that, but let's that's the top of section thirty three. Let's look at. 
the top of section 33. We've got the, you know, the Pendleton the Grand Wagon Road going right through here. Mm -hmm. And then, then these, the, you know, what they drew on the map was just sort of speculation about where the road might have gone. Right. So you don't have anything down here or right. over here or even in between here. You just have these. And, and this is uh, old immigrant wagon road. This is from the early 1864 survey. <laughs> And then if you go up here to this, this is the 1887, this is the Pendleton Le Grand Wagon Road, okay? This seems to me through here to be, you know, Pendleton Le Grand Wagon Road may be just uh, the, uh, the old emigrant road evolved. I've always, I've always wondered how the surveyors wrote down the name of something and they knew it was the Pendleton Le Grand Wagon Road or an old stage road made them decide on that terminology well they were they were uh <clears throat> they were uh, contractors that generally lived you know in the area so they would have some possibly some local knowledge okay of of uh you know of of the area um they were just you know just contractors and there was whole whole families of surveyors, you know, the father, the son, the grandfather, they were all, all surveyors. And they would say, say, live in Legrand or Pendleton and, uh, you know, and contracted with the government to do these surveys, you okay. know, over, over, a, over a number of years. In fact, they had, you know, steady employment because areas were resurveyed or areas that hadn't been surveyed before were as people, you know, homesteaded them. And they wanted to keep track for, you know, for legal reasons of where, property boundaries were. So um, I don't know. One of the things I noticed here was we have, this is uh, uh, James Kern and James Nolan, uh, Pendleton Grand Wagon Road, but they don't show any Pendleton Grand Wagon Road crossing this section line. All they have is this one here, Kern and Nolan, Old Stage Road. And then uh, crossing the, the top of uh, section 20, we have uh, Pendleton and Grand Wagon Road again. So, you know, apparently they didn't wonder, well, what happened to the road in between here? Maybe this is part of it too. So I, I don't know. I don't, this is Wendell, and I don't know if it's germane to the discussion, but Working with a gentleman named Paul Patton and the state parks, at one time they were talking about an exchange of properties to add Oregon Trail to the west southwest into the park and changing with the investment company, state lands, other way. And OTAC made several trips up into that area with boots on the ground. Uh -huh. And now we are dealing with the red dotted line. We're not dealing with survey markers and we're dealing with what is, I'm gonna say local history. And we know that that sometimes combines historical fact with mythology. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. But what we found <laughs> out to the West of the park boundary and it was a fence that ran in a north south direction to access it we went north of the park turned onto the first gravel road and drove in i wasn't driving but we're approximately three quarters to a mile and then you turn back southward to the left and back there you accessed uh what appeared to be trail ruts climbing a hill there were dual ruts with supposedly a grave in the middle i don't know if the grave ever picked out that uh, proved out but there were a parallel set of swales going up a hillside and moving off to the north uh northeast and was always assumed that it would link back to the further trail route lining up uh in the curve to dead man pass but we, there, there were potential trail swales and ruts all over the hillsides in that area. Now, some of them were obviously new logging roads, newer. The area had been logged. 
but when you stepped off the road and looked in the brush, they look just like the stuff behind you. And as germane to the discussion, we went to the south, I'm saying south, southwest corner of the park property. And we were told that uh, that was a trail route coming up. And we were said that was part of the church property. It had benches sitting along it coming up and joining across the um, park property. And we were told by Patton and the gal on site doing a lot of research, and I've got her name on my computer, that the, the trail never came through the park. It stayed to the west, and the people would drive down in and loop back to the trail, down in and fill their water kegs and loop back to the trail. Uh, in that uh, spring, the springs down there, and in contention at that time were some trees that uh, they were alleged to have uh, hub rubs on them coming through that area. Now, the springs that we saw basically are bogs today. The water level has dropped and sink, so forth and so on. And one of them sits. Uh, in the area of the meeker marker that has been moved to that site over, well, recently, more recently, it's been moved from Meacham up, but it's a meeker marker. And, and but it would be, we were told that the trail never came through the park per se, it always stayed off to the west and that they would simply swing down in to fill their kegs to go on down the trail. And in 93, at a place called Reynolds Ranch, which is off Old 30, north, would be northeast of the park. Uh, the 1973 wagon train, the facsimile, camped on a place on Reynolds Ranch that had, to, according to the ownership, an Oregon Trail campsite. Now, I don't know how that lines up with what you're seeing in the diaries, but I hear again that some of that's local history and local mythology put together. But uh, it was accepted by the planning group. Uh, that's, um, well, that was Lowell and Dick and Jim Renner as what it appeared to be. And it was about here again walking distance mile mile and a half over where the oregon trail route would have crossed 34 at uh, 84 at that inter that interchange so it's probably around in the area of that dot that you've got there i don't know but right, right, right in here, here. Outside. yeah along in there about a mile up from that interchange as i remember and then from there, uh, we descended on down into uh, the Umatilla Valley. But everything that we viewed and we walked, and Glenn was the picture taker. And Glenn, are you on? He had, Glenn was, uh, took a lot of pictures and photos in that area, and I'm assuming he still have them. Has them. I'm, I'm, I was, if you forget, I was the walker, snooper, not the picture taker. Yeah, I was with you, Wendell. This is Henry, and I walked those and took a bunch of pictures, but I did not have them, my pictures tied to waypoints. So be just a general area, but it's up uh, north of that interchange. Yeah. On the east side of 84 and on the east side of the old highway. And, we, and, and yeah, and the gal from the park there led us on down the east side of 84 along old 30 uh, on a what she believed to be the route going down through there. And one of the markers of the old routes was telephone poles had been cut off and, and don't exist. That, you know, usually they ran along the old uh, telegraph roads and the um, first electrification projects, but it was through that area. And for whatever that's worth, that's, we made probably North, uh, probably OTAC made, three, maybe four trips up into that area. And then we were also up, oh, up, we were also up in that area with the OTAC and Jim Renner and that group, Ackerman and 
Tiller OTC planning for the 93 uh, sesquicentennial. So, but unfortunately we didn't have the GPS capacity and we were just dealing with the local knowledge and apparently what's on the ground and uh, didn't get a lot of it most accurately recorded, but there's quite there's a lot of there are a lot of things up there that sure look like things I've seen before. Let's put it that way. You know the pictures that Henry uh, took. He he sent some of them to me. We're over here by the overlook. Some yeah, by That's the that. overlook. <clears throat> and some of the other uh, some of the other authors show ruts through here along Highway Thirty. Yeah. Okay, so that's definitely definitely part. Now, when you were in the park, you say that you went past past the, past the park the road and turned back, and then came up this way. That's right, because that was that area that at one time they were speculating to maybe doing a, an exchange with the investment company and adding it to the park because of the trail swales and things that were in there. Yeah. <clears throat> and there are there are ascents and descents, maybe the old maybe the old wagon roads or whatever, but they they if you forgive me, a swale is a swale going up and down a hill and uh, they're easily recognizable. Right. <clears throat> What's not recognizable, of course, is when they were made. And no, that's what I'm saying. And uh, to my knowledge, there's OTAC did not have the capacity to do any, or we did not assume the capacity to do any further expo, uh, you know, ob other than observation, we didn't have any, we did not assume the ability to go in with archaeological evidence and metal finders and things to see what was there. Right. Right. So when you uh, <clears throat> you were in the park, are you talking? Uh, you're talking about this section of the park here, right? Yes, we drove to to, <clears throat> and what I believe the part that we're in discussion concerning now, we drove to the south part side of the park. There was a there was a water tank out there and there was like a maintenance shed and those things out there and we parked and we walked up along that southern boundary and there was a set of either an old road or a set of swales coming right up along the back, back uh, south fence. Now, that looks like that may not be close to the uh, recognized route that we see here. But uh, what I'm looking at on the ground looks a lot like uh, that road coming right there near the, set, the southern boundary. It slanted up across an open field and they had the church group or someone had put some benches or markers along and it ran right along the fence line, right along the fence line, like the curve there, and then turned off and we went back around and, and walked in that area around that west, southwest corner looking at swales. Okay. Okay. Now the, um, the, 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 the church camp is down here. Okay. Now there's, there, there's some park, there's some park buildings here. In fact, I think that's where the manager has his office. Well, that may be where we were because it, it, we drove quite a ways. Yeah, you'd have some maintenance buildings there and yeah. some equipment and that sort of thing. And I think the manager's office is down here. The church camp is over in here. Okay. Let me get. And I, that, all I'm saying is, and that's recollection from oh two oh oh four oh five oh six. I mean, that's quite a ways ago. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, one of, one of the things is, um, you know, researching the, uh, the, the surveyor's notes is, is that it's a whole lot easier now than it was back in, you know, <clears throat> even, even in Evan's time, you know, let alone uh, uh, Percy Brown's and, and uh, 
in, in, in Earl Bickmore's uh, era, they had to actually go to the location where the, you know, where the, where the maps and, and surveyors notes were actually kept and go through them by hand. Now they're on a website and you can, you know, I've got all the surveyor notes for two townships downloaded and, 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 and sorted by, you know, page number. So I can go, you know, I can go through them. It's a big job to go through them, of course, because you're reading, you know, all of this, all of this handwritten text, which is a challenge in, in itself. But, uh, you know, I have access to the maps, which are sometimes, sometimes helpful. Sometimes uh, some of the stuff on there is speculative. You know, they show a creek. Well, where is that creek? You know, uh, I don't see a creek there now. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it, it's just a whole lot easier now. So and then and then and also uh, you know documenting uh, you know photographs in, in in swales and such with GPS. That's you know everybody's got a GPS on their smartphone. You know, but 20, 10, 20 years ago, maybe you know ten years we did, but you know twenty years ago, thirty years ago, forty years ago, you know they didn't even have handheld units. So. And Robin, the down there where you said the maintenance, the office of the director and stuff is that visually lines up with what I'm remembering in my mind. Yeah. Much okay. Better than okay. Yeah. So it slanted across. It ran along the fence line of ways, and it broke off. So that that is what visually I see in my mind. The my remembrance of how that came across right right <clears throat> now this is showing this is oregon state land this is the church land here and they also apparently they own this in here and uh this is the john hancock life insurance company here and here uh state of oregon owns a little piece there it looks like so that's kind of the the, own, the ownership of that area Hey, Robin. Yeah. Um, at the bottom left corner of section 28 and the lower right corner 29, uh, go over there, yeah, that sur surveyor note mm -hmm. on the right on the, on the section line there, one more to the left. That's right by my photos that I have plotted and my GPS I have plotted, that's right where we went, right through there. Right. I was walking with, with Wendell and we saw the bench and all that. That's really close to that point. Okay, let's see if I can get here. There's your locations for a 2013. And these are your waypoints for 2014, but I haven't tied those in with any of your photos yet. So, yeah, okay, I'm just, that's the one I'm talking about now, the, the uh, right at that uh, section, that is, or the intersection of all those sections, 28, 29. Right, okay. Yeah, that uh, okay. green dot, green and white dot line is where one of my walked up. Okay. I think that bench is right up just above the, or pretty darn close to where the section line is there. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so you sent me all the information so I can tag that photo into one of your waypoints. Yeah. That's all in the document you sent me. Okay, yeah, I haven't, uh, haven't gotten to that yet. So yeah, this has been, <clears throat> something that I wanted to have was a discussion on, you know, this area. And I know that some of you had been there and I knew that Henry had taken photographs and we uh, tied some of these in like, uh, you know, here's this waypoint is tied into uh, Henry's photo number 161. And, uh, you know, that's uh, <clears throat> that sort of thing. So I can actually get a visual, you know, idea of what, of, of of what that looks like. Yeah, but you'll see those two trips that I made in June of 13 and June of 14, know where they is, know where, 
is anywhere near the red dotted line that's right. down to the left or a yeah. mile away from that. Okay, Robin, you think we've uh, covered the grounds, so to speak, for, for today? It's amazing. Uh, really, a lot of imp good information. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, pretty much what I had. I just wanted to. I knew that uh, it's too bad uh, Stafford couldn't make it, but uh, 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 who else wasn't here that would be useful? Would be might be helpful for this area. Um, Chuck Hornbuckle. Yeah, Chuck would have been a good one. Um, yeah. Also, the uh, the park manager, Mark Miller. Um, I've been talking to him. Um, yeah, yeah. Have you been talking to him? I have not. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Uh, maybe <clears throat> he'll obviously be a part of the the, the later uh, park service project, but right. uh, he might be somebody that I would want to contact. Um, uh, I don't, go ahead this Wendell and I don't know if he's still available but the pre the person that we work with up there all the time was a guy named Paul Patton he was getting close to retirement age I believe and so he may be retired I don't know if you can contact him or not I I will send you I think I've got the state phone number for him though I don't have a private number yeah I I, I know Paul okay um, Actually, through an, through another acquaintance of mine who's a photographer, and and actually took a trip out to uh, do some you know Fort Rock in that area to look at uh, look at caves with him you know a couple of years a couple of three years ago. So I know Paul. Was he the park manager? He was. Well, okay. also it was like he was a department manager. That was he was over several parks, but he was a direct contact we had with as OTAC. He was the man that led the tours uh, and was the contact for anything on this potential exchange that never happened. Yeah, yeah, I, I think Mark Miller is his replacement and because he, he has kind of the same responsibilities covering, it's yeah. not just Immigrant Springs, it's all the little parcels in that area. Yeah, the last time I was with Paul, he was at Smith Rock, so. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I want to thank you very much, Robin. This has been great and a really a, a, a wonderful summary of all the research. It's you know extending over more almost seventy years now for some of this research, and I, you really brought it together nicely. I'm very impressed with the CalTopo software. Uh, you're you're beginning to convince me <laughs> on this. It's it's quite good, and. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what's being shown now. <laughs> <laughs> That's your screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm getting an echo here all the way through. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> so have you stopped sharing? Yeah, I stopped sharing. Okay. Since I'm seeing a, a mirror image of you off into infinity here for some reason. <laughs> Not sure why. <laughs> Boy, yeah. I think I'm still seeing your screen. I'm not sharing anymore. <laughs> well, I, I was that happened. We're seeing somebody, so I'll, I'll turn it off and see what happens. There's Henry. There we go. Okay. I, I, I accidentally clicked on something and there was my picture. <laughs> no, I. Um, the CalTOPO software, yeah, this is a subject that we want to explore more in our mapping workshop and things. But uh, remind me, um, the, the CalTOPO is um, uh, 100 bucks a year. Well, that's <clears throat> I have I have the hundred dollars a year, but there's actually you can use uh, you can use a lot of it for free, and there's another couple of uh, you know options. I don't know. I think there's a fifty dollar option and a twenty dollar option. Yeah. Depends on, uh, you know how many how many map sheets do you want to have on, on any one map you know that sort of thing okay okay you know it, it has it's tied in with their server resources and such they also have a product called sartopo which the uh, uh the search and rescue teams use because it has a you know communication feature where you can you know you can 
<clears throat> be out in, in, in the field, have to have a Cal Topo on your Android or, or, or Apple phone and be able to communicate with other, other team members. So. Okay, well, um, something for others to explore if they're interested in, in using some of these different uh, software packages. Um, I want to remind you, we have another Zoom meeting this Saturday at 1 p.m. And the subject of that is going to be uh, uh, Howard Driggs and Ezra Meeker and their work, uh, early work on the trails organizations uh, and, and how, how that evolved. That's at 1 p.m. on Saturday. If you, um, Marley Shirtleff has put out an in invite to all the chapter members, but um, if you'd like to attend that and don't have access to the link, uh, contact me, WelchDJ at Comcast.net, and I'll make sure that, uh, that you get the link on that. Um, I think that's it. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share with the group? I think the only thing I can say is just this presentation just made me realize what a, what a valuable contribution Robin is making with his knowledge and detail. It's incredible. Mm. Um, all, the, all the information you just threw out us and the thoroughness of your research. It just, I want to thank you. Yes, excellent research. Excellent. Yeah, I I, I would just you know, want to get out there and hike and, and, and hike hike through that area and hopefully this summer I'll get a chance to do that. You know, like I said, I was over at uh, there the past two summers, but Blue Mountain Crossing was either you know shut down for the uh, for the forest fires or for the pandemic. So want to get out in the field. Yes, don't we all? <laughs> Okay, I think we're all set. Right, thanks, Robin. Thank, Thank you all for attending. All right. See you next time. Thanks, Robin. Okay.